Oh, come on, church. Do we believe that he's giving a better word this morning? Do we believe that he's giving a better word this morning? That he has a good word in store for you this morning? I felt this question while we were worshiping. What do you need today? What do you need today? I was reminded of a few weeks ago when Stefan was preaching and he was talking about when he got ordained as, as a reverend and they gave him a new title. And when they put a new title beside his name, people began to treat him a little different. And I was thinking about my walk with the Lord and the different seasons and the different stages of life that I've gone through with him. And at, at different seasons, he's been different things to me. He's, he's had different titles in my life. At first, I knew him as Savior. And then in a different season, I knew him as Father. And then in a different season, I knew him as Friend. But when I began to attach Lord to his name, when I began to attach King to his name, when I began to understand, oh, he has authority because of his title, that's when I began to believe for things in my life. So... What do you need today? You need a little bit of joy this morning? Do you need a little bit of hope this morning? Of peace this morning? Scripture says, if you and I, being evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more does our Heavenly Father know how to give good gifts? And here's what I know. If it's good, He wants to give it. If it's a good thing, He's wanting to give it to you this morning. He doesn't hold back from his kids. He's a good father. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's give it up for the worship team. Thank you, guys. Before you have a seat, tell three people you're excited to see them this morning. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Well, good morning. Welcome to the dwelling. You guys feeling good this morning? Uh, if we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Christian. I get to help out with communities around here. And um, yeah, communities. You guys excited about those? Coming back in the fall, I'm excited. In September, we'll have some dates pretty soon for you guys. But it's, it's, um, it's really good. We, we, love, we love communities. It's part of our church. It's, just not, it's not something we do. It is who we are, is community. So we're excited for those to kick back off. We're still in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. You guys enjoying going through the Gospel of Matthew this summer? It's, it's kind of taken us the whole summer, but that's okay. We're going to pick back up uh, with two more chapters today. And if you are new, welcome. So excited that you're joining us this morning. Um, and if you've only been at the dwelling since we've been doing this series, you're probably like, who is the pastor? <laughs> like, there's a new person preaching every week. Um, and I'm not the pastor, just so you know. Um, our pastors, uh, Gunnar and Bethany, they are on sabbatical right now. They've been in ministry for 20 years and never take it like an extended time of rest. So they, they'll be back in August. Um, but we're praying for them as a church. We're praying that the Lord fills them with rest. Um, but until then, you're stuck with a bunch of different jokers like me. Uh, and uh, I hope that's cool with you guys. We are, like I said, we got two chapters to cover today, Matthew chapter 21 and 22. I'm going to read our scripture here this morning. Um, we're going to be focusing in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40 for the most part. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I think we have it up here as well. We can read along. But it says this in Matthew chapter 22. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Pharisees got together, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Amen. What's the, most, um, what's the most dangerous thing you've ever done? Not rhetorical, like actually looking anybody. What's the most dangerous? Who has a dangerous thing they've done? Sam? 
walk through the sewers. Wow, that is dangerous. Anybody else with some other dangerous? What's the most dangerous thing you've ever done? Skydiving. Wow. Um, I'm going to just say that you guys are way more dangerous than I am. I, uh, I like to think I'm a pretty safe guy. You know, I don't think anybody's ever just looked at me and been like, you know what? That guy, I bet he does dangerous stuff. <laughs> and, uh, but I do have one story. I have a dangerous story. There was this one time where Addison and I, we had just gotten married. We were planning this camping trip with, uh, with her dad, or her brother and her dad's girlfriend and uh, we were going to Providence Canyon. You guys know about Providence Canyon? It's this beautiful place in Georgia, which I had no idea existed until I was in my 20s. I've lived in Georgia my entire life. It literally looks like the Grand Canyon, but it's in Georgia. And it's about three hours towards the Alabama border near Columbus. Um, it's incredible. If you haven't gone, you should definitely go. Uh, it's worth the trip. They're not paying me to say that. I don't work for the Providence Canyon State Park, but it's worth the trip. And we were out there and we were camping and exploring the canyons because there's like 16 different canyons, some of them about 150 feet deep. And uh, we're hiking or exploring, doing the camping stuff, tent camping, making fires, that kind of thing. And, and so as we were walking one day, Addison's dad and I got uh, separated from the rest of the group. And I'm not, I can't remember how it happened. I just know at one point it was just me and him walking, okay? And uh, Addison's dad is a, is a pretty free-spirited guy. He's, he's not like a big, tough guy. I think more of like hippie, go with the flow, let's find an adventure type of guy. You know, he's got a little bit of an edge to him too. So him, on the other hand, you might look at and be like, I bet he's done some dangerous stuff, you know? So we're complete opposites and we're stuck together in this canyon. And at this point in our relationship, we don't really know each other that well. Uh, we've never actually even been alone together. And so now here we are alone in this canyon walking. And at some point of us trying to find our way back to the group, he starts climbing up one of the canyons. I don't know if he's trying to get a better vantage point. I don't know. I, I'm just sitting there. So I'm like, I guess I'll follow you because you seem like you know what you're doing. And so we start climbing these canyons and we get like 30, 40 feet up. We've been going for like an hour and we finally get to this ridge that's kind of sticking out. And so we've kind of been on like a little plateau and then there's a ridge that goes over to another plateau. And, but the ridge is, is just big enough for you to get your feet on. Like it's a very like narrow type uh, climb to get to the other side of this plateau. It's probably about 15 to 20 feet in between these two places. And if you haven't been to Providence, uh, it looks just like the canyons out in Utah. The only difference is the canyons out in Utah are made of stone and rock. And Providence Canyon is actually made of clay. It's soft, like, so it's just it's soft to the touch. And like I said, the ridge was just wide enough for you to, like, get a step in like this. And so if you were going to try to cross it, naturally, if you stood there, I mean, it, was just, it would just fall from under your feet because it's clay. And I, not a dangerous guy, assumed we're just going to turn around. Like, dang, we almost made it, you know, better luck. Let's try this way. And before I could even finish that thought, Addison's dad just takes off and full sprint across the canyon. As he's running across this ridge, the clay is literally giving away under his feet. It's a you got to run faster than the ground beneath your feet falls situation. Like, but then he makes it to the other side. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And then he just looks at me and says, come on. And then he just disappears behind a rock. <laughs> and so now here I am, I'm stuck. I've got to make the decision. Again, not a dangerous person. I'm also pretty directionally challenged. You can ask my wife. I really, I'm just, I don't remember where I'm at most of the time. <laughs> and so I've got to make this choice of do I try to hike an hour's back down, an hour's long trip back down to where we started and hope that in one of these 16 canyons, I'm going to run in to somebody or find, or find our group. Or do I, do I run after her dad across this ridge and risk my entire life? <laughs> because we're like 30, 40 feet up. Like if he would have fallen, if I would have fallen, I mean, it's an ER trip, no doubt. They are carrying me out of there in, an, in, in a helicopter. <laughs> and so... I'm thinking about it again. We're at a point where we don't know each other really well, you know, so I'm thinking about it and for a second and then I decide, you know what, 
Addison's dad ain't gonna think I'm no punk. And so I just start, <laughs> I start running with everything I had in me. I ran across the ridge and I made it to the other side. And yeah, thank you, you know? I think he respected me a little bit more after that. Um, he never said that. I just like to think he thought that about me, you know? <laughs> leading, up, leading up to our section of scripture, because we kind of need to know what we're stepping into when we get to Matthew 22 and Jesus is talking about the greatest commandment. Where we're at is Jesus has been stirring up a lot of trouble and, and putting himself in a lot of dangerous situations. Oh, shoot. Did he just do a sick transition? <laughs> That's how you transition. Uh, come on. I'm having a good time. They gave me a mic this morning. It's not going to be that. Way. So where we are at, where we are at is in chapter 21. Jesus rides into Jerusalem and he rides into a, a royal greeting. Like people are beside themselves to see Jesus. They're cutting palm trees down. They're taking the, the coats off of their back, laying it down just so that Jesus can walk over it. And they're screaming as he rides into the city. And we still celebrate this, by the way. This is Palm Sunday. That's where we're at in, in, in Matthew's gospel. And then once he gets into Jerusalem, he goes to the temple. And it, every, most of us have heard the story where he turns the tables over. And he makes some pretty, pretty strong statements while he's in the temple. He heals the blind and the lame in the temple, which is a big deal because there was actually a thousand-year-old tradition in the temple that did not allow the blind and lame in. And that wasn't by God's design, by the way. There's like an Old Testament backstory to that that you can go read about, but it happened under King David. And then there's this weird story where Jesus is, is walking by the fig tree. Y'all know this one. And he goes to get some fruit. It didn't have any fruit. Jesus curses the fig tree and it dies. His disciples are like, what just happened? <laughs> Apparently Jesus hates figs, noted. Um, and, uh, and so there's that weird part. And then Jesus says, the part where he says right after that, if you have faith, you can pray and tell this mountain to throw itself into the sea, which isn't so much a statement about prayer or faith at, because he's, the, the mountain he's talking about, they're in Jerusalem, so they're walking beside a mountain. On that mountain is the temple. It's the temple that the mountain is built on. And so his disciples would have understood this kind of covert messaging that Jesus is saying, like, the mountain, if you have enough faith, the mountain where the temple is at, you can throw that into the sea. And so Jesus goes on to say some more, teach some more parables, say some more things, all of which are statements actions and teachings about that are bringing the temple's entire existence into question. And as you're reading along in Matthew's gospel, it becomes really clear that Jesus is not here to reform the temple. Jesus is here to replace the temple. Jesus, which makes sense because you get to the part where Jesus said, I am the fulfillment of the law, which is to say, I am the completion of the law. The old has passed away. The new is taking its place. There's a new way to love God. There's a new way to experience God. There's a new way to be human. And this is dangerous for Jesus because we have to understand Jerusalem is governed as a theocracy. There's no separation of state and religion. The, the religious laws were the governing laws. So if you broke a religious law, you could be on trial in a legal court for breaking that religious law. And the temple leaders definitely understood Jesus' messaging and statements and actions. And it was at this part in the gospel where, where they began their passionate pursuit to have, find a way to have Jesus arrested. To which a few days later they will succeed and he'll be arrested and tortured and then crucified. And that leaves us with the question, well, Jesus... If the temple has to go, what are you replacing it with? And that's kind of where we find ourselves in our verses that we just read. We'll read them one more time. Jesus said, hearing that, the, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, which was a religious, means they're a religious expert. It's the same thing as a lawyer because it's a theocracy. They tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And in these two commandments, Jesus is laying out a vision for his disciples. He's laying out what's coming, what is being, what the temple is being replaced with. My discipleship, your discipleship will never outgrow these two statements. You will never move on from these as you walk with Jesus. The standard is no longer the temple and temple life. The standard is no longer the 613 mitzvahs, the 613 commandments in the Torah. It's, it's the new standard is love. Now, Jesus, when he responds, he's quoting a, a Jewish prayer. If, you'll, if you're reading in your Bibles, you'll notice there's a double quotation. It's because he's pulling from the Old Testament. This prayer is called the Shema. Everybody say that, Shema. It's a prayer that is traditionally prayed in the morning and night if you are a practicing Jew. And the literal translation of the Hebrew word Shema is to hear. To hear. And it's not like just to hear as in, you know, noise is coming into my brain and then I understand it. It means to hear and obey. Like it would be like if Addison and I got, were in an argument, which may or may not happen sometimes. And she said, no, 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 you're, you're listening to me, but you're not hearing me. You're not Shemaing me. Does that make sense? And so the first part of Jesus' response when he says, love the Lord your God, that part, he's quoting the first part of the Shema, which is found in Deuteronomy 6. And we're going to flip there really quickly because I think it's important to know what the context of this verse is. Verses 4 through 9. Probably been a while since you flipped to Deuteronomy. That's okay. It's a good book, you know. Okay. Deuteronomy 4. Chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. And then listen to, to what the context of these verses, what they fall in. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So this is where we see Jesus pulling from. There's an urgency attached to the command. Don't just hear the words, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, but actually shema them. Actually do what they're saying. There's a, there's a practical working into our life that needs to happen. Talk about loving God with your kids when you're sitting at home, when you're walking, at coffee with a friend. Talk, talk, take a walk, catch a sunset to remind yourself of his beauty. Go get a pillow from TJ Maxx with a verse on it. Put them all over your house. (laughs) Get a tattoo, change the lock screen on your phone. Whatever you have to do, do not stop reminding your heart of his goodness, of his beauty, and of his love. And don't just hear this Work it into your life. Really work it into your life. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Hebrew word for the English translation of heart is levav. And when we say heart, sometimes it's kind of difficult to know what we mean because we use it with several different definitions. But levav in the Hebrew refers to your inner self, your inner beings, to love God with all of the stuff that happens inside of you. Your thinking, your feelings, your, your emotions, your desires, your will, anything and everything that happens inside of you, that is to be directed towards God in love. The second part, love God with all of your soul. Soul is, a, is an English word with a lot of baggage to it, right? Like we don't always know what we mean when someone says soul or we really don't even think about it too much. But usually in the Western world, the definition we, we most attach to comes out of the Socratic and then the Platonic thought around soul, which sees, sees the soul as this invisible, kind of detached from the physical thing. Like when we die, the soul, which is invisible, kind of floats up to heaven. Like that's kind of the, the idea we normally picture when we see soul. But that is not really the Hebrew definition of soul, it definitely wouldn't have been Jesus' understanding of soul either. The, the Hebrew word there is nefesh. Touch somebody say, nefesh. <laughs> We're speaking Hebrew this morning. You didn't even know. That's free. <laughs> now, nefesh 
in the library of scripture is closer to something of your whole being, to your life force, which includes your physical body, okay? Your nefesh, your soul is not detached from your physical body. I was listening to Dallas Willard, who's this brilliant Christian philosopher, and he had a talk online, and it was a Q&A section, but he had been talking about the soul, and someone asked him, because he was describing it in this way as, as attached to the physical, a living being, that kind of thing, and someone said, well, do plants have souls? I never thought about it, but his answer was yes, plants have a soul, and then my mind was blown. I had to rethink everything I've ever learned, every uh, Pixar movie I've seen about a soul. <laughs> And so, you know, think about that next time you cut your grass. Um, <laughs> but I'm a dad. All I have is dad jokes. This is all you're getting from me today. So um, you can think of it like this. This will probably be helpful. It's helpful for me. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. Does that make sense? And you can kind of see where Paul picks up on this in Romans 12 when he says, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, your bodies as a sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So we are to love God with all of our soul, with all of our bodies, with all of our being. And then the last part there, love God with all of your strength. Like bench press, bro? Like we're in the gym for Jesus? What does strength mean, you know? Like I'm benching 300 for Jesus right now, you know? And you're like, bro, you don't bench press 300, no way. Shut up. <laughs> it's a tough translation, again, because we don't actually have an English word for this. Um, it's, it's actually an adverb, and so it, it means something closer to, to much or, or very. Uh, a good place to find it in Scripture would be in Genesis when God says, uh, when it says God created everything, he looked out and said it is good. And the Hebrew word there is me'od, me'od. So he said it's me'od good. It is very good. It is much good. And so it's this idea that we are to love God with our muchness, with everything outside of our body. My favorite translation that's most helpful is, is with your influence. You are to love God with your influence. We're to love God with our capacities and offer him all of our influence, whatever our hands find. God, here are my giftings. God, here is my money. God, here is my relationships. Here's my career. God, here is my muchness. This is the context we find ourselves in when Jesus is pulling for this. In our pursuit of God, we are to offer him everything in our lives, to hold nothing back in our attempt to offer love to him. And it doesn't leave room for us to say, well, God, I'll love you with my money, but I'm keeping my emotions. God, I love you with my influence, but I'm keeping my sexuality. God, well, I'll love you with, with, my, with my emotions, but I'm, I'm keeping my mindsets. I've got some opinions I'm not quite ready to let go of yet. I'll love you with my career, but I'm, please don't ask me to give you my relationships. He wants us to love him with all of it. Touch a neighbor, say all. It's a no negotiations, no holding back kind of love that we're supposed to offer him and we're to work that into every part of our life. Body, your inner person, your thinking, your feeling, anything that you have influence over, there is a, it's to encapsulate everything. Do whatever you gotta do to remind yourself to love God. And so... If you're feeling tension in your life right now, could it be that you are holding on to something that he's asking you to let go of? Is there a mindset you can't just quite let go of yet? You want to be right about this thing. Is there a timeline for your life that you just can't let go of yet? Opinions that you're just unwilling to change at this point. And I'll say this because I'm not the pastor and I don't get paid, but is he asking you to let go of your money? I'm not even saying you got to give it here. He might be asking you to give it to a family member or a stranger, someone he's put on your heart who needs your money. He might be asking you to budget and save. <laughs> the idea is he just wants to be able to ask you 
and know that you're not holding on to something so tight in your life that he can't speak into it. And he can ask for everything from us because he's given everything for us. He's not asking for a love that he hasn't already given himself. He didn't want slaves. That's not the context of why we were created. He's always wanted a loving union with us where he gives everything to us out of love. And in return, because he's been so good, we give everything to him out of love. And it's this beautiful reciprocal relationship that he's always desired from the beginning with us. Why do you think the New Testament uses the imagery of marriage so much? Because that's the way our, our relationship with him is to be pictured a union. We are his bride. And some of us are still trying to figure out if he loves us at all, he does. A lot, actually. Because that's who he is. Scripture identifies God as love. It's not a virtue of his. It's not a characteristic of his. He is love. And now back in our verses, it's interesting to me, or it's funny that Jesus doesn't stop after love the Lord your God, because they only asked him for one commandment, but in typical Jesus fashion, he, he offers two, something for them to think about. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The first command from Jesus measures our heart for God. The second command from Jesus, love our neighbor as ourselves, measures our discipleship to Jesus. Let me preface this too by saying, it's usually not a good idea when we try to measure our discipleship to Jesus. I'm saying this is how Jesus measures our discipleship. When we try to do it, we're always trying to figure out what rank am I on, right? What level am I on? And I know it's hard, but it will always push you towards pharisaical tendencies. It will always gratify that, that, that religious spirit that's always lurking. Because usually when we try to measure our discipleship to Jesus, we, we, we do that by what we input. How much scripture did I read this week? How many coffees did I go on? How much time in prayer did I spend this week? How much theology did I expand? How many things do I lead? It's this, what are we inputting? And that's often how we try to, to measure our discipleship. But, but Jesus seems to flip it on us and measure our discipleship to him, not by what flows into us, but, but what flows out of us. And so we got to quit treating God like a CEO, <laughs> Like he's coming around once a quarter with his Christian spreadsheet checking on your performance, right? Yeah. Well, there's a 12% increase in attendance to church, but there's a 7% decrease in tithing. We need to level those out a little bit, you know? That's not how Jesus measures our discipleship. He's not measuring it by what you put into you. He's measuring it by what flows out of you. We care about the other stuff. We care about ranking and measuring ourselves against other people. Jesus doesn't care about that stuff. He wants to know how you treated the Parker's employee when you got gas this morning. He wants to know how you've been posting on Facebook. Is it in love? He wants to know if you've been giving grace to that person that's been talking about you. He wants to know, are we loving our neighbor? Are we loving our neighbor? And, and neighbor means everybody. Touch somebody say everybody. everybody. Family, strangers, friend, enemy. Jesus tells us not those people that are like us or what can offer you or whatever their social standing is, regardless of their political affiliation. It's very clear that Jesus, when he says neighbor, he means everybody. And we will exhaust ourselves trying to perform for God. His love didn't strive for us and it won't strive in us, I promise. Another verse where we see Jesus measuring by, our, by what flows out of us, he said this in John 13. He said, love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Everyone will know that you belong to me if you love one another by what flows out of us. 
And that is why Jesus gives us the second command after the first. Because you can't possibly love your neighbor as yourself without loving God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. You will exhaust yourself. It is relationship with God first. And the more deeply you are in a loving relationship with Jesus, the more deeply you are enamored by his beauty, the more deeply that you are obsessed with getting near him, the more of his love will begin to flow into your life and then it will fill you up and flow out of you into somebody else. And here's my little cultural exegesis. Our culture right now is exhausting. And it's filled with anxiety. It's filled with a sense of being overwhelmed because it is a culture that is desperately trying to make sure that everyone is loved, that everyone is seen, that everyone is cared for, to make sure that our neighbor is loved. But it wants to do that outside of the context of loving God with all of your being first. It wants a kingdom of God, the fruit of God without his kingship. And you cannot have one without the other. Love doesn't work when you strive for it. It just doesn't. It only works when you're so full of love yourself that you begin to spill over into everything around you, everything you touch. And now before we pat ourselves on the back, like, yeah, church over culture. Yes. We rule, you know. Before we do that, before we get there, we've been really guilty of doing the opposite. And Piano, you can come on back up. I'm coming to a close. We get really passionate about loving God with our being. And that's great. But often we neglect being passionate about loving our neighbor as ourself. We flip it. And in doing so, we will trade the culture's exhaustion from only wanting to love God as your neighbor for the church's spiritual frustration of only wanting to love God. And you will feel frustrated because his love isn't content being still. It's endlessly looking for broken people to make whole, to fill up the world with. His love is never satisfied. Once it fills up one person to overflow, then it be begins to move to the next person and 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 the next person because God doesn't run out of love. He is love. There's not enough vessels to contain it. There's not enough human beings to fill up. He's always looking for more. Does your faith feel mundane right now? Does it feel frustrated? I love God, but it just seems like, I don't know, I've been loving him for a while, but there's just a block almost. Like we just come in here, we sing our songs, hear preaching, talk to somebody, and then we walk out, and then we just wait until next week. Do you feel restlessness in your faith? Like you've hit a ceiling almost. Could I suggest that maybe the Lord is extending an invitation to go deeper in your love for people, to go deeper in your love for neighbor, in your love for serving this world around us. And how do you do that? What's biblical love? It's a love that lays down opportunities to get what it wants so that other people can get what they want or what they need. It's a life of service and sacrifice, not out of obligation, but out of overflow. Freely given, joyfully given on behalf of other people. The pinnacle of this type of love is found in Jesus says, what he says in John 15, he said, no greater love is there than this to lay down one's life for their friends, to which he did. He reached the pinnacle of love and he laid down his life for his friends, for you and I. And he's calling us to do the same. We become more and more like him. We become more and more like love itself 
when we lay down our lives in small ways each day as we learn to serve one another, as we learn to love our neighbor. And each day we get closer and closer and closer to becoming, and this is the goal. This is what the vision for your life looks like when you're following Jesus. The goal is to become people free from the need to get what we want all the time. To become people that are free from wanting and having to get what we want all the time. It's the purpose with all relationships in your life, in your life, marriage, children, community, because relationships come with restraints naturally. I can't do whatever I want. I can't do whatever I feel if I'm in relationship with you and I wanna love you and serve you. Whether that is you as my friend, whether it's that with my wife Addison or my son Eden, I don't get to just do whatever I want. I have to think about somebody else first. And that's the purpose of these great relationships, great friendships in our life. Because the, re the restraints of relationships aren't supposed to be resisted. We're, we're called to embrace them because they are actually freeing us to become people who are being transformed into love. That's why communities are so important. That's why it's not just a church activity. Communities are the activity of the church. It's a place where we come to practice these things, to practice loving our neighbor as ourselves, practice serving people, practice walking with people through things, sacrificing for others, asking for forgiveness and giving forgiveness. That's the context of relationships in our life. And don't hear me saying this, because I'm not, I'm not saying you gotta be a doormat. That's not what I'm saying. Not to, to, to not have a sense of self, not at, at all. If you are constantly loving God with all of your being, you will be filled up with his love. And his love is where you'll find your identity. His love is where you'll find your sense of being, your sense of worth. And there are seasons where you gotta get filled up first. I know, I've been there. A lot of those seasons. You gotta know who you are in Him. You gotta get that sense of identity in His love. But when you are full, do not cap His love because it is wanting to move through you into somebody else. And I'm coming to a close. If you love God like this, with all of your being, if you love your neighbor like this, you will be in danger. And what was dangerous for Jesus' life will be dangerous for us as we try to follow him. And no, we might not face a physical death, but there is a death of the old person as Christ creates something new in us, something freer in us, something more human in us. It's dangerous to what you want. It's dangerous to what you believe. It's dangerous to how you want to respond. It's going to cost everything. It's going to cost your opinions, your convenience, your beliefs. It's going to cost us our religious attitudes. But if you are willing to take Jesus up on his vision for life, on this vision for life, and love like this, then it's promised that we're going to be a freer human being and that he's going to actually transform us into a person of love, something eternal, something more human. Let's stand. Lord, thank you for your love that gives us everything we need. Thank you for your love that fills us up. And thank you, God, that it's not content to just stay in us, but you actually have a plan and a purpose to use us to share your love in other people's lives. Holy Spirit, give us boldness to love this way.